David, 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 David Banner. You deal with so many different personalities while in the studio. How do you remain even keel? How do I remain so even keel dealing with different personalities in the studio? Um, one thing about engineering, and most most great engineers will tell you the same thing. Engineering is a field of 10% technical skills, 90% people skills, especially when you're dealing with creatives, because the whole thing is you're juggling egos. At the same time you're juggling egos, you're also trying to make everyone that's creating and contributing to the record as comfortable as possible, because the more vulnerable you can have an artist be, the better the more authentic their delivery, their performance, the art is because they're vulnerable. They're allowing themselves to be vulnerable. So for me as an engineer, I always say I, I'm even keel because A, I have to juggle so many different personalities and make people comfortable, but at the same time, I still have to be present enough to capture that lightning in a jar and be able to make sure that they can be vulnerable and they can be creative and not have to worry about anything but being vulnerable and creative. How do you approach a mix mentally without being burned out from the constant demand of your talent? I approach every mix pretty much the same way. And that is usually, that is with the conversation with the artist and the producer, um, if I can. But if I just, for whatever reason, I'm not in communication with the artist or the producer, I always make sure that I listen to the rough mix that they've been living with for you know, however long they've recorded the song, because something in there's there's elements in that rough mix that I can extract to be like, okay, well, let me figure out the feel of the song. Like it's my goal as a mixer to enhance not only sonically and technically a song to make it commercially viable and pleasing to the ear, but also to maintain and enhance the feel, the intended feel and that's the the intangible part of the record. You can't I can't sit here and tell you like uh a setting for you press this button and the feel is there. Like you have to just innately extract that. And so for me, I approach every record with trying to determine what the feel of the record is. And once I figure that out, then it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward for mixing. And, you know, that's just typically my process. What is it like receiving a record to mix that may not be a personal preference of song, but shrugging it off and delivering the best version of the record possible? So for me, because I'm mixing a lot of records, there are times that certain songs just aren't my cup of tea. I can't relate. I, it's just not for me. And I've gotten to a point in my career where I can be honest with myself and say something is not for me, but I'm still the ultimate professional. And so typically what I do with songs that I'm necessarily not feeling, I almost, I almost use the approach that I remember I, I saw uh, Michael Jordan talk about it in his documentary, uh, Last Dance, where he talked about creating games in his mind just to motivate him to go out and be and do amazing things on the court. And it's something that, that it was between him and him, between himself. And so for me, records that I'm just not feeling or just aren't my cup of tea. First and foremost, um, who am I to, to criticize anyone's creation? Because that's someone's creative vision. So that's it's my job to take that creative vision, breathe life into it, and put it up and get it out into the world for the world to hear. And so I respect that and I respect the creativity. And so what I'll do is a lot of times I'll play this game with myself and be like, okay, well, I don't like the record now. Let me see if I can mix the shit out of this record to make myself like the record. And that's just a, 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 a challenge that I have with myself at times where it becomes a little more difficult to find, you know, elements in a song that I like. So that's typically what I do. But I'll, I'll never just straight up be like, oh, I'm not working on this because I don't like this record. No, that's someone's creative vision. And, and at, at my core, I respect that. How does it feel to be sponsored by some of the largest music companies in the business? Well, for me, being an engineer, and most engineers can attest to this, we're gear geeks, meaning that like we love tech, we love pieces of gear, we love buttons, we love knobs, we love technology, we love plugins. The name of the game now, a lot of times, is the plugins, which is a software version of hardware nut, uh, knobs and faders. Um, so it's surreal to have major companies like Waves, who is a huge uh, plugin um, developer and company reach out to me to be one of their um, brand ambassadors. Um, so it's surreal to when I can click on a plugin and see, 
coriander setting, which that just that's that still just geeks me out. So it's it's surreal. It's 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 a humbling thing, but it's also something that has been a long, you know, been a long time in the in the process. So it's cool that, you know, I work and I and I and I engineer because I genuinely love to engineer, but it's cool to notice to know that other people are noticing what I'm doing, even though I'm not out there beating my chest like, ah, I'm doing this. You know what I mean? It's just I'm behind the scenes and it's cool to be strictly judged on the work that I'm done, I'm doing and not anything else. In 2010, was winning the Grammy validation for you or was it just icing on the cake? So in 2010, I won a Grammy um, working on BB and CC Winans um, album still. And that that it, it was it was an honor to to win a Grammy. I mean that puts you in elite company. Um, I had been nominated once or twice before. I remember I was nominated for Akon's Convicted album, and then most recently I was nominated for um, Tank and the Bangers' uh, Green Balloon album. So it's always a surreal thing, just because the Grammys, you know, is is one of the pinnacles. In music, it's not the defining pinnacle. You know, there's there's different opinions, but it's still something that you're measured amongst the best in the biz, and so that's truly an honor. And for me, it just gave me further validation that I'm on the right road, that I'm you know tapping into my my um my true mission in life. How did the pandemic affect your workflow? Um, it's interesting. The pandemic has affected my workflow in that. It's been keeping me super busy and I'm fortunate to be able to be at a point where I can still socially distance and still get work done. And now more than ever, content is becoming king because people aren't moving around, you know, artists aren't out on the road and this and that. So even more so now, they're leaning more heavily on me to be able to get their mixes to them and get them back to them. And the content is coming a lot quicker just because they're able to create and I'm able to give them mixes and to put out in the world to create content to further entertain the world. And so the pandemic has been good to me. I mean, it's almost like I'm working just as much, if not more than I was before. But because we're not out in the world, we're able to, to stack. We're able to spend a lot more time with I'm able to spend a lot more time with my family and loved ones. And it's, it's pretty cool that I'm able to connect with the people that I love most more, but still be able to work more. It's kind of a, a weird thing. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a gift and a curse. There really seems to be a very laid back and family oriented vibe on the David Banner podcast. How is it being a part of the show? Being, being, being a part of the David Banner podcast has been amazing. Um, one thing I can say is that chemistry is king when it comes to, to a lot of things in life. And having the right chemistry, having the right mix of people around you does amazing things. And that's the one thing that the David, that's one thing, one of the things that the David Banner podcast has is the chemistry. That's something that you can't buy. That's something you can't coach. You can't teach. You can't create. It just is. And so that family atmosphere, that family vibe that Banner has created is genuine. Like it's cool to see all of us come together. We are, we come from all different parts of the, the country, from different walks of life, and come together and just it's like we're family, you know. And, and that's just such an amazing thing. And you know, I gotta I gotta tip my hat to Banner because he could have easily gone out and gotten you know a bunch of well known celebrities to do this podcast with him, and the chemistry may or may not have been there. We don't know, but one thing we do know is the chemistry, the people that that we have. Um, Regina, Scott, Sali, all of us together has created such an amazing thing. So it's, you know, it's truly, it's, it's, it's just dope to be a part of and just watch everyone grow. Watch Sali blossom and grow into, you know, who he is and, and Regina and Scott. You know, Scott to me is the funniest guy. I mean, his, his comedic timing is epic to me. It's just always on point. Can you explain all of the dog references? <laughs> so all of the dog references, shout out, and this is this is ba- Banner, this is Banner's doing. So maybe a week or two after we did our first podcast, um, I got a new puppy. And you know, I mentioned it on the podcast, I mentioned it to Banner, and he took it and ran with it. He already knew that that um I was a dog lover and that my girlfriend's a dog lover and that she had a little small dog. So, you know, Banner being true Banner. 
you know, he's got, always got to make the, the sexual references about the dogs and whatnot. Um, Regina calls it going to the dark side. But um, that's where all the dog references come from. It's from, you know, just me getting a dog and mentioning it on the podcast. Corey Anders in five years. Paint a picture. Corey Anders in five years. Um, I would say I want to obviously continue to be doing, continue to mix be mixing. Um, one thing about me is that I genuinely love mixing. Like, this does not feel like work. And so, you know, I'm so fortunate that I'm in that position that it's almost like, I won't call it cruise control because I'm well aware and, and, con- and well capable, but it's just like, I look forward to every day, every, you know, every experience because every song is a different song. And so, Corey, in five years, I definitely want to still be mixing. I do... And I can say this, you know, the Banner podcast really has kind of brought this about me, but I kind of, I, I am kind of digging stepping out and being a little more in front. I, you know, got into this game to be behind the scenes and, and be more, you know, just back. But it's kind of cool that the, the, the Banner podcast has brought me out to the forefront a little bit more. So five years, just continuing to grow and be more out in the forefront. I can see myself, um, doing some more production type work and just helping those coming up behind me. Um, one thing I'm often asked is, you know, how how am I so willing to um, give, give you know, give up and coming engineers, you know, some of my, my quote unquote secrets or my tips for mixing or this and that. And one thing I've learned is that, you know, first and foremost, I am a fan of music. And so because I'm a fan of music, I always want, the music to sound great and nothing irks me more than hearing a dope song that sounds shitty and so when people ask me why why would you give away your secrets and i don't look at it like i'm giving it away i look at it like okay if i can help this next this engineer coming up behind me um perfect his skill and i give him some tools for his tool belt and he goes on to mix records that i love that's dope to me and it's no one thing about me is I've never looked at engineering as competition or any of that so it's just dope to be able to you know be fans of my peers in this game and just be fans of the music and just sit back and just listen to something and be like oh that was dope I I love the way Leslie did that on that mix I love what Guru did with you know with Jay or Dot you know it's just dope to be a fan and so in five years, I, you know, honestly just see myself doing more of the same, but growing into a space of production. And, you know, that's that's pretty much where I see myself. Is there an end point or is working in music something that you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life? Um, I don't I don't see an end point with music. Um, I just see an evolution. I see me evolving. Um not from mixing, because I think I'm always going to be mixing, but I see myself evolving into creative aspects with, you know, producing and even songwriting. I mean, a lot of it is production. I mean, like, using the reference from uh, Hustle and Flow, I got these beats in my head, man. You know, I I do. And so I'm at a point now where I want to learn how to play the piano, be able to learn how to, 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 to produce more, just because I do have that, that itch, that creative itch to scratch. So, I see myself doing music to the day that I die. Thank you for supporting the David Banner Podcast.